We never think about, you know, the benefits or all the good things that are going to happen. We think about all the negative things are going to happen because we're trained by the amygdala to do that so we can survive. Part of it is, is getting beyond that into an emotional state to feel what does it feel like to have a bigger solution? What does it feel like to think bigger? You have wonder what you would be able to do if you were the ultimate version of you, right? You would then have an easy time creating what you want. And yes, effortlessly enjoying life too. Now, you may know this already. The influence you have over your reality is far beyond what you've been told. Soon, you realize that your outer world is merely a mirror of your inner world, and we're here to connect the dots for you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to God. Mode. Welcome back to God Mode. Now, this episode, we have a special guest, Aaron Baer. He's one of our friends, but also he is a highly skilled, internationally renowned facilitator. And I have been wanting to invite him onto our podcast for a long time. And we finally got synced up on schedule. And we're going to talk about some things that I think all of you are going to benefit from. We're going to be talking about confidence. But in a very unique, battle-tested manner, we're going to talk about the mental models behind confidence, why it exists, how it exists, and how Aaron's able to put that into practice in front of billionaires and mega organizations, Fortune 100 companies, and how he's able to facilitate top leaders in these organizations to have massive success using this model of confidence. And I think you're going to really enjoy it. So let's get into it. Welcome to the show. Thank Thanks, you for Will. being Thanks here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to uh, get on your show, God Mode. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a fun time waiting. I know that I've been out of town, you've been out of town, so we are finally able to get on here. Yeah, let's do it. You look younger every time I see you. Like, I, I was not going to comment on this, but it's very obvious. It's, com it's confidence, Will. It's confidence. <laughs> yes, yes. The more uh, you get used to me being around, the more familiar I am, so... You're more endeared to me now since we've got to know each other. Yeah, and that youthfulness begins to really radiate even more, right? Yeah, the aura. You're seeing the aura. I like it. I like <laughs> it. I like it. Even more radiant than before. Oh, man. Well, you know, I mean, part of my journey is uh, to reverse my age. So um, it's I'd working. say I'm successfully doing that, and uh, that is part of building building more and more confidence so that I can think bigger, um, have bigger conversations, you know, the conversations we're having with world leaders and, you know, uh, heads, CEOs of, of major Fortune 500 companies, um, you know, as you, as you feel, you obviously give that energy out. So I appreciate you acknowledging my youthfulness. Yes. Um, several of my girlfriends always somewhere along the line have said the same thing and they compare me to Benjamin Button, which I don't like where that ends, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad that I'm in some stage of uh, reversal. This is the optimal case where you, you stop at your prime. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. 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 That's it. Huh. Well, I'd love to I'd love to give the viewers and the listeners a little background on how you got into facilitation and like how did you get so good at it? If you don't mind giving us a brief history. Yeah. So um, I had a digital strategy firm uh, called Buzzmouth and um, while I was building that I was one of the early adopters of uh you know social media wasn't even a term yet you know this is started around 2000 2001 you know we talked about content strategies and um this was uh you know pre-Facebook and pre uh, pretty much all the different social media platforms today but there was like MySpace and then there was content strategies there's search engines email marketing and um you know really uh content to kind of really drive out your message so while I was doing that, what I really came across as a speaker, and I started speaking on the subject of how do you move traditional advertising into um, really this digital medium. And, you know, I had some analogies that kind of resonated with the world. And it was, it was like the idea that um, some people would say digital is a slice. And I would say, no, it's a layer. It needs to connect to everything else you're doing. And so with that, I worked with some organizations out of Europe called... Um, 
Hyper Island, which is out of Sweden, Chaos Pilot out of Denmark, and a company called WDHB out of uh, Switzerland. And they wanted uh, American facilitators to kind of facilitate change, which ultimately the biggest change topic over the last 20 years has been digital transformation, which really results from this advertising paradigm shift. And right now there's no advertising without digital, without that layer. I mean, you can go and, you know, you can buy bus benches, you can buy outdoor, but generally everything's a call to action back to something digital because everyone has a digital component in their pocket that they care with them everywhere. And that literally is where we've gathered all the data and information. And now we can dissect that and really kind of deliver, you know, one-on-one messaging to those people. That was something that I saw and kind of shared. And I even went down to MNC Saatchi in Australia and spent uh, six weeks helping them re kind of invigorate, you know, how they did advertising and, and really connect digital to everything that they were doing, which was something that was very resistant to people that, you know, had grown up as creatives thinking they just wanted to do this. They wanted to do this creative thing. Their job was changing. It was requiring them to think bigger about themselves. And also, you know, I, I, I use this kind of analogy. It was analog dollars. They used to charge, you know, gargantuan amount of money to, you know, create a video or do things um, into digital pennies. When you put it online, it was literally driving it down, um, driving all the advertising medium down as far as, you know, getting costs. So advertising firms didn't necessarily, uh, they were kicking and screaming, fighting that. Yet there was these little digital firms like mine that were literally beating them up because we'd take project work and we'd go into these major Fortune 500 companies um, like Coca-Cola and Harley-Davidson and Dannon and we would go and build a digital campaign that delivered results for literally a tenth to a hundredth of the cost. And now today you see that everywhere. You see the fact that um, it's very easy to measure results digitally and it's it's very much, you know, as you get better and better at that, um, I think that's where, you know, the strong suit is. I was helping those really large advertising agencies kind of shift to that. And then that led me into the Fortune 500 companies that then wanted to do digital transformation to say, okay, we need to get something digitized, you know, and there's always a deceptive period after it gets digitized. But once it's digitized, it becomes exponential. And then there's a point when it disru- it's disruptive, and then you'll never catch it again. So I would literally tell these companies, like, yeah, you may be beating these digital companies right now, and they're, but they're growing at a faster pace. So there comes a point in mathematics that that faster pace crosses over, and then you can never catch them again. And I've experienced some major companies kind of foreshadowing the, this digital revolution, you know, from, you know, 2004 till, you know, till 2024, you know, I'm still talking to companies about this same paradigm shift because everyone's on that journey to kind of get there, to be more efficient with their marketing dollars, but also their leadership of just how do you get people engaged when um, there's so much noise versus like, what are the signals of the market to kind of cut through that chase? Wow. So you came from advertising and digital transformation, but then there's a big part of the story that people need to hear about, which is how you went from taking people to transforming and and really helping them get into the digital age to facilitating multi-billion dollar companies like Coca-Cola and others. Please don't be humble. Tell us. (laughs) Well, so... You know, facilitating is an, an art, and it's. Um, I've been in and out of 500 different companies, and I took several companies. We would go and, you know, we'd go to Tel Aviv or Singapore or Shanghai, and my program team would make these kind of meetings where I would take a board of directors or a senior leadership team, and then we'd meet with like 12 disruptive exponential companies to kind of prove this point that I was saying is, you know, we're moving from the analog way to a digital way. Let's look at what these companies are doing. So the companies were very excited to meet Coca-Cola or uh, Daimler Mercedes-Benz or Belfius Bank, which was the National Bank of Belgium, because they saw opportunities in partnerships and and different opportunities to kind of figure out how they would grow and learn from each other. So we created these learning exchanges that I facilitated. And in that, I, you know, this is goes to our subject about confidence is, you know, you get put in enough of those rooms, you see enough questions, you see enough, you know, you start seeing these themes that every company has like six or seven themes of things that go wrong. 
and you see them over and over and over again. And we were able to kind of create an authentic, candid conversation between the two companies by having a facilitator, by having someone like myself on board to not just like have the facade of one, you know, one major company sharing with a small company. I was able to kind of break down because I'd been in and out of so many different companies. I was able to break down the questions that then would kind of yield insights for people to have their own aha or eureka moments. So they'd be like, oh, wow, that's why that happens. And, you know, most of the time they were very resistant about my message starting off. And if we went on a three or five day trip over that time, you saw this shift because part of the confidence of being a facilitator is knowing that you're never going to create consensus, but you need to create action. And part of that action is getting the different people with different perspectives to literally say it from their perspective so we could dismantle it. And I think one of the things that's given me the most confidence and this goes to your world and where your world and my world has kind of crossed over is the fact that I would break down the language barriers, you know, and I started doing this politically even where, you know, one side person would kind of use words that meant something different than what the other side would say in a small exponential company that's growing really, really fast. Use some words because some people had worked in corporate America in very different ways. So I was keen to kind of break down, well, what do you mean? What's the definition of that? And what we did is we dismantled the language and started building a common language as we facilitated this exchange. And these exchanges were, you know, an hour to two hours. But my clients, who were, you know, the board of directors of these major companies, over a three-day period, were going in and out of a dozen companies. And then I was also delivering these kind of keynotes in between to kind of share what are the learning learnings to help them be disruptive to themselves, to understand exponential, to understand the digital age, to understand like how would they change their culture to make digital part of the fabric of it. And all those subject, I kind of became literally the, you know, I'd say the world subject matter expert because I was in and out of all these companies. I heard from firsthand these companies that were unicorns um, in all these different places in the, the, you know, the most crazy entrepreneurial ecosystems in the world. And I was able to bring that knowledge back to a, a conversation to help people kind of see for themselves, how do I think more exponentially, which ultimately led me to write in the book, Exponential Theory, The Power of Thinking Big. And that is a culmination of, of learning, literally going in and out of all these exponential companies, but seeing it both from the corporate lens, because I came from Accenture. I mean, I had worked in really, uh, big consulting and I was a strategist and was, you know, even at an early age to kind of back up a little bit, um, in my mid twenties, I was presenting to the board of directors of a telecom company cause I was put on the communicate, the PMO staff of a communication of a $38 million project. So every week we had to give an update. I was the one they sent in to the boardroom to say, here's our update, you know, Hey, we found, and this was of all things, this was about Y2K. So if you remember the Y2K era, we were, reporting out like all the potential uh, hazards of Y2K, which was probably the most overbaked and most profitable thing Accenture did. We actually won the uh, the biggest award. It was called the Pinnacle Award um, for being the most profitable project. And we uh -huh. celebrated that with our client, which is a, an interesting thing to do. But in that process of communicating this was like, hey, we were mitigating their risk. And from that, you start to see you know, if you're put in an early age to go in front of a bunch of people that have big egos and a lot of experience, you've got to be on point with your subject matter. And you've got to also steer people back to where you want to steer them. And that goes to media training or interviewing or anything. And that's part of facilitating is to understand that in the room, you know, I think the group dynamics is what's most important where I've been most successful in facilitating is taking some of the people that are introverts and some that are extroverts and understand how do I mitigate the voice of the people that are loud? Because in general, on a leadership team, mm. it may not even be the CEO, but it's someone working on behalf of a CEO that has the loudest voice or the biggest stick. And my whole goal was to, um, with my words and with my way of controlling the conversation, is get other people into this conversation before those people dominate. And it's very easy to spot those people. And that's where you start to gain confidence because people are very predictable. Um, mm. in the way their habits, as much as they're unpredictable over time, when you've been in enough rooms in front of enough people, you realize 
there's people that want to insert themselves so that their opinion, their opinion is so matter. And then there's other people that are introverts and candidly have thought about it a lot more. And so you start playing this game of how do I get all of the signals out on the table? Because otherwise I just hear the same noise and we get caught in this trap of doing what we've always done. And, mm. you know, we really fought that, you know, in our group dynamics of having these conversations but I was able to break down, you know, it's, I'd ask, you know, someone would say something and I would immediately, you know, the quiet person in the room, I would say, well, what do you feel? How do you feel about that? I wouldn't say, what do you think about that? Because if they say think about it, then they're just going to give you the canned answer that they know everyone else in the company would give. But then you get them into an emotional state and you start getting deeper. And I think that was part of facilitating a group um, at the highest level, you know, board of directors of, you know, literally the top. 10 companies in the world, I worked with all of them at one point. So it's, it's, you know, being in that kind of conversation and being in the room with people like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and Bill Gates and different people and seeing the power influence they had with their words. You know, I had um, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. I was in a meeting with him and all he had to say is three words and it shifted all the energy in the room. He's like, we're not doing that. Or <laughs> how many words is that? We're not doing that. So four words. Um, and it's like, okay, well, and that's all he said. And then all of a sudden there was no one ever going to challenge that. Right. So the problem with that, and that's the problem is you then have an autocracy, right? You don't have a democracy of the best wisdom of the crowd of the talent and being a facilitator is to recognize that we need all the perspectives and that's why diversity and inclusion and making sure you get a wide range of perspectives before you get into making solutions. So it's part, you know, in those facilitations is defining the problem in a way that everyone understands that this is what we're solving for before you let anyone start giving solutions, because there's always one person that thinks it's so easy to give their solution from their point of view, but they haven't had that perspective. And that's the beauty of you get a board of directors or you get a senior leadership team. You have all these different departments. They all have very, very different perspectives on what that problem is. All of a sudden, you're now it addressing the unintended consequences of a problem because you're literally saying it from different points of view. What happens is people then start to kind of grow their solution base before I let them get to solution base. And it's, it's literally like this idea of... Um, diverge converge you know i mean i literally it's a design thinking model that is one of the models is to let people kind of well let's create lots of ideas of what this problem is and then let's we will create lots of ideas of how to solve it and then we'll actually come together and actually figure out how to you know get to a solution where we can take action like i said not consensus because that's the illusion that you could have everybody you know, agreeing to something, you can have everybody agreeing to what action they would take in a certain direction. And that was where I, I feel I became a, you know, internationally recognized and endorsed facilitator and why I've, you know, facilitated in 500 different companies. And, you know, that led me to, you know, having conversations with lots of very, very important people, billionaires, and realizing that uh, we're all human. And, uh, mm. you know, however you want to look at it, um, you know, I was prepared walking into those meetings as a subject matter expert of facilitating to know that I was going to be the best at that in the room. And the reality is every single person wants to challenge at that level. They want to challenge you. So it's putting them one by one to understand that I'm going to manage this conversation. And if we're going to get to an outcome, it's because we're going to play by my rules as a facilitator. And I slowly would insert kind of these parameters to kind of move people forward. But it's really easy to get a group to move forward together because one or two people don't really want to stand out in a group at that level. They want to find, you know, it's kind of like survivor, right? They want to find these other people that they can align with. Um, but when I started shifting from problems and I got them to think about problems in the first way, they hadn't ever thought about it in that way. So we literally would get those people, um, those, you know, senior leadership, like, thinking new ways to solve for this problem, which meant that when then I took them to emotional, I was like, well, how would this make you feel? And how would you do this? And all of a sudden they were thinking very differently about solving this problem. And the one thing that I would strongly suggest anybody that gets in front of a group or a billionaire or, or a world leader is, you know, find the emotional response. You know, if we think in logic, you know, these people have thought 
through and they have been prepared by their chiefs of staff. And you got to think every one of these people had notes on what they had logical ways of like, this is how you're going to solve the problem. They had whole teams that analyzed all the data, but where it became unique when you facilitate at that level is the fact that I took their egos out because I made it fresh as a fresh problem. And then I made it emotional and then I made it personal because as a senior leadership team, you know, your career is on the line every time you're in front of your peers. So I literally would create that intensity so that we would literally have a really unique conversation to kind of drive out, you know, change in that organization. And, and a lot of times it's just majority of people are resistant to change. They will tell you they want change, but they will absolutely do everything possible to not change. And you know that as well as I do. <laughs> It's one of the funniest things I've caught in, in life and in what we've done so far. It's that is very true. People will say they want to change, but the actual change process require the reconfiguration of investment versus reward, pain versus pleasure, which takes more work than just thinking. Yeah. And, that, and that's the goal is not have people think, have people you know, react, have people get to their intuition. You know, we, we talk a lot about that. And that's part of the, the magic of uh, having confidence is understanding that I have, I always had to deal with ego. And I was very aware that ego would literally drive conversations in whatever direction the person with the biggest ego has. So you oh. had to dismantle that quickly. And that was part of, you know, when you have someone that, you know, can say four words and literally change the whole conversation, um, without any perspective, you're not solving any problems. You're literally creating more problems. And that's the unintended consequences of thinking you're solving this problem when you're not solving this problem. You're literally creating all these problems by thinking that way. So how did you walk into that conversation to be mentally prepared to dismantle people's ego, especially ones with big egos? Like what, what did you do in preparation for that? Or was it something that came pretty naturally for you? Over time, it, you know, you, you kind of learn, you know, like I said, I had so many of these conversations, and they become very similar. So you start seeing the data of what people present to you. Mm. You start in your own way, kind of understand the personalities. I mean, I had studied every kind of personality uh, test. Um, I would go into rooms and kind of figure out who's going to be just by how they interacted. You could see hierarchy. Um, I would always have the same kind of prep that I would, you know, do for myself before I walked into that room, you know, thinking, okay, here's the subject matter. Here's the potential issues. I would do a little research on each of the person in the room. So you have to be ready. I mean, I think it's not easy, but at that level, I didn't want to go in unprepared. So I literally knew their names. Um, you know, I kind of, I knew a little bit about them personally. Um, I always asked whoever the organizer of the group is like, tell me a little bit about each of these people. And then I would go and look at their bios and I would understand where they came from. And that's where a lot of these organizations, you know, they have the perfect bio, right? To get to where they're at, they have the perfect bio. So you had to then, you know, as a, I'll call it a, put my human resource hat on was what is underneath this? You know, what is their driving motivator? And if you start to learn each of the motivators, what happens is I subconsciously, and I'll say this, I, I kind of trained myself. So I subconsciously had enough of these conversations that I was literally having a subconscious conversation with all the people in the room. And that's where I would identify who's an introvert, extrovert, who had something really to say, who had, who I didn't mitigate. And I would literally, if someone were to talk and they'd kind of, kind of monopolize, it's like, hey, let's hear from some people that we haven't heard from. Just little, little keys to kind of, then those noisy people will feel, they start to feel that emotional pressure to not say. And then, and then if they kept doing that, then I single them out. And I said, well, obviously you feel like you have this all figured out. How do I help you kind of, you know, let other people kind of share their point of view. So maybe they could expand your viewpoint on it. So it's, it's, it's just a, a conversation. How, how do you kind of help people, you know, get, get, get to where they can move forward in a conversation versus be stuck in a conversation, which is where honestly most conversations in the corporate world are, they're just stuck because someone has an ego and they're not going to let go of it and they have power and influence. So they don't really share it. Oh. That is true. That happens even in a relationship, right? Yeah. Personal relationship. Ah, so how how did you get them to open up just by having a conversation? Like, what's that? There's got to be a 
really well calibrated level of confidence for a billionaire or or a top executive like that to be like, okay, yes, Aaron, I'll open up and let's do this. Well, the thing is, is everybody likes to talk about themselves. So, and the more important you think you are, the more you want to talk about yourself and tell how important you are. So oftentimes I would just drive into the emotion of what, what, and I would figure out the motivators of each of the people in the room by just saying, you know, and I, I would literally get a little history. I was like, let's get to know each other. And I'm like, well, why did you end up being the chief legal officer? You know, what was your path? And I was like, give me the 30 second version. And I would have them say it in front of the whole room, but then you would get insights. They wouldn't literally, now I knew their bio. They would literally tell me a personal story in 30 seconds because I was asking for the emotions of what motivated them to get to the role that they're at because they had to overcome a certain amount of diversity to kind of get there. Or they had to be enough resilient to kind of work their way up the corporate ladder. Oh man, if our government had a facilitator, this would be a different government, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, you're, you're, you're really trapped in ego and, and hierarchy, you know, based on fundraising and special interests. So you really have a, a system that is not going to move. And then people are embedded in the fact that they don't want to make big changes because they have to get reelected every two years. So they're not going to, you know, swing for the fences. They're not going to do what's right for the constituents. They're going to do what's right for them to get reelected, which um, that short-term thinking is another part. So I think another key, Will, is to, to help people think longer term because when you start saying, well, well, that's a great short-term solution, but that's what you've always done. You know, the fact of the matter is, is, uh, most people think about this quarter or this week or this month, maybe this year, but they don't think about 10 years out. And both of you and I know the power of thinking further out. So that's one of my first questions I ask people or I kind of challenge people is, well, what's the 10-year plan of the organization? And what's crazy is these large organizations don't have those conversations. They have three-year plans. They have five-year. They literally have that all spelled out because they think they can predict that. The reality today with things moving as fast as they are and as digital they are, and they're so disruptive and exponential, there's no longer can predict that. But they have to have a longer-term vision to be able to kind of get the insights that they think big enough to even change with what's changing every day. Mm-hmm. Mm. And some people would even argue, why have a plan th that far out when you really can't predict? Uh, you've probably heard many people say that. Yeah, and I, I think if... You know, as, as, as you know, if you don't have a plan for the future, then that plan's made for you. So having a North Star, you know, a lot of times what I share with boards and, you know, just two weeks ago I was in Colorado with a, a board of directors and I just kind of said, hey, let's create your 10-year vision. Let's all talk about what that is from your different perspectives. And so they all shared that. And that was a different conversation than they've ever had before. You know, they were used to just talking about the emergencies they had to put out and all these different things. And, um, and the senior leadership team was in that meeting as well. And so we broke down their perspectives to say, you know, now you understand what a 10 year vision is. Now, if you all can get action on this and understand that, and we started kind of lining that up. What I always share is when you have a 10 year vision, it generally happens in five years if you're all focused on it. And that is the magic of, or the value that I deliver when I go in and facilitate is all of a sudden the organization makes decisions much quicker because they have a bigger vision. They can make mistakes faster because they know where they want to go versus like where they are. And I think that's the importance of making decisions, which regardless of how fast the world is, they have to invest money over time to kind of get to where they want to go. They mm -hmm. also could be very short term and say, let's cut cost to six months to a year later, needing to hire back people because they let people out go in certain areas. And we're seeing that in the tech world in the last couple of years and different things. But having a longer term vi vision is understanding like how do we get to there versus how are we here now? Because here now, you know, as much as, um, you know, you create your future now, it's figuring out how do you create the strategy to get to the next, the next breakthrough. Mm. It's very informative. I feel like I just left a lifetime listening to your last bit <laughs> like I could see visuals of how you walk into these room how you manage these conversations and the kind of perspective you have and I think the audience also had a I mean because I went into a trance just listening to this right there's definitely 
a lot to be said about those years that you spent facilitating. Would you would you say there are some major, like really big learnings that you hadn't even considered during that time until after that you wish you knew from the beginning? If you if you do, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I I think you know as I kind of grew, I I got you know you get better at your craft the more you practice it, and I was practicing it quite a bit because I was traveling two weeks a month to some city and a lot, a lot. And I was going in and out of, you know, 40, 50 companies in a, in a two week period. So, you know, you start adding that up, you start gaining perspective on what works and doesn't don't work. And I think part of being a facilitator is, is really f- feeling the communication uh, that you're getting from people and understanding what is the body language, what is the tone what is, you know, and it goes to neurolinguistic programming and, and a little bit of hypnosis and different things is to understand like, okay, everybody has a different perspective here. Yeah. If we're going to bring them and align them. And I always say, let's establish the vision of what we want to accomplish. Let's create that alignment and then we can go and execute. And that's the action part. And what I can do is I can slow people up because a lot of people just want to rush to, well, this is what we should do. And that's the solution versus bringing them back to where I get them into the vision of, Okay, this is the vision of where I want the company to go. First, and then the alignment is bringing people that they're all aligned with that vision. Then you can start to talk about the solutions or execution of how to do that. And I can use each of those stages as a tipping point to kind of bring people back to vision, alignment, execution. That is so aligned with how we teach the resolution program. Mm-hmm. It's, it's designing where we want to go first and then resolving what's holding them back. That's the pattern that works the best. Yeah. Some people just go about resolving stuff that actually has nothing to do with anything. It's not taking them closer to the goals, but knowing what their goals are clearly, then resolving, that makes all the difference. If you don't have a facilitator, you're just, you're going to be led by whoever has the most powerful voice in the room. Yeah. You know, the facilitation that we've been doing in Upgrade mainly has been personal for people and or for businesses. But when you and I got together, we started talking about what if we do this for the world? What if we do this for nations? And that conversation really got exciting because I think that the unique skill sets that you've already acquired throughout your life and the protocols that we've created really allows us to do this at all of the different levels at a pretty efficient manner. So here's the question. If I, now this is just, you know, a question that came into my mind right now. I'm wondering, you know, since we're talking about vision, what do you envision happening over the next 10 years? Let's say in an ideal scenario, we're able to utilize everything we know and really create the changes, the exponential changes that you and I have talked about. What I, I, The reason I ask this is to illustrate, to demonstrate, to show the audience what they may or may not have considered and that if they can join us in considering this, if they can turn their focus and pay attention to this vision here that we're, t- we're sharing with them, energy flows where attention goes, yeah. it's just going to feed this vision, right? So I'd love for you to share what what your thoughts are and I'll add whatever my perspectives are because I think the world needs to hear this. Yeah, so I mean, your your vision to upgrade humanity, um, in a way, in some of our conversations, you know, uh, interplanetary, you know, this, this, like, how do you think bigger than this world that we live on? Because then you can come up with solutions for the things between here and there. And I think yeah. that's part of an exponential theory. I wrote this book about in, in, in chapter three, there's the idea of singularity. And if, if singularity has happened, what are all the technologies that have to happen to get there? And then it starts giving you a roadmap of what the changes are going to happen and how fast they're going to happen and the speed to that. The same with change of nations or of organizations or of teams, of groups, of individuals. Um, when you can get them thinking out further about themselves, then they're personal everyday goals become these habits that 
they start making better and better decisions because they have a longer term vision for themselves. And I think as we kind of had these conversations and, you know, your, your, uh, your vision of upgrading humanity. And I had this vision of creating a million change agents, which, um, to me, a million change agents is bigger than Google's vision of organizing the world's information. Because if I create a million change agents, then there's no problem unsolved. And these change agents are really facilitators. If you really break it down, like all that I've learned as a facilitator, how do I make a million change agents, whatever they care about, they can go and facilitate and change that in their world. And I've really embraced this idea of change agents because inside companies, there's a certain amount of people that need to be change agents, which uh, there's different stats. It could be 5%, it could be 10%. And then there's 90% that need to maintain. But these five or 10% or 10 of people will ultimately disrupt the company create a new yeah. business model. And they often have to do that outside of the company. And that's where in, in my book, Exponential Theory, I have a whole chapter dedicated to this is mm. really the skunk works or the think tanks or, you know, these, the pirate ship at Apple or, you know, the, the different companies have had different kind of ways to kind of create innovation, but those change agents are able to see the future. And that's where, you know, as a futurist myself to understand like, okay, we're on this path of technological change. AI is great. AI is exponentially better when you apply it to 3D printing and then you apply it to biochemistry and then you apply it to, and you can think of any multiple exponential technologies. And when you start stacking those, and mm. I facilitated these conversations, they get really creative and real interesting quick of what's going to disrupt your company or what industries are going to collide with yours, even though you think, and that's what's happening is the world is kind of consolidating while we create this movement towards the future. I think, our, your vision of upgrading humanity and what got me so excited is you have different pieces of the individual matrix of, you know, hey, here's how you can upgrade your mind. Um, as we talked, you know, part of it is when I go in to facilitate, I'm upgrading the whole room into having a mind that all is based on action, based on a purpose or a vision, a common vision, a shared vision, that they can create that change. Once they believe that they can create that change, based on the fact that we establish the vision alignment, and now they're going to execute on their specialty, then literally magic happens because their conversations all change. They all start to respect each other's areas of domain, and then they start building on each other much, much more quickly. And that's part of creating change agents. You need to do that inside any company. You need to create the growth and innovation in a company. But the real innovation is not to disrupt the company from the beginning, is to build mm. that momentum and then bring that innovation back. The same with if you're going to go into a country, and we've we've had this conversation. Yeah. Is how do you actually build that innovation so it has momentum or build the new thoughts that you need to kind of create a new culture, to create a new meaning for what it means to be Ukraine or Israel or Switzerland, you know, all these countries that potentially have identity crisis on their future. How do you actually have a conversation with and it builds in the masses because you only have to touch about 3% of the people, which are the true leaders to kind of start building some momentum. Yeah. Then you can obviously um, kind of set a new course to start aligning all those people towards the new execution to create that vision. And I think there's a step-by-step -step process to do that, um, that in facilitating that I've really learned just because I've been in and out of so many different things, but it is, it is about confidence and it's about, getting the people that are so confident and they have such big egos around what they're confident about to recognize that they're a piece of the puzzle. I'm only a piece of the puzzle. You're a piece of the puzzle. Um, together, we're a much bigger piece that can make a much, much bigger impact. Now, as we go along, we've, you know, we've picked up another, you know, we had a conversation the other day. You have other pieces of the puzzle. You realize like systemic change like this is all about momentum. It's all about creating that alignment and creating that exponential curve, right? Like, so it's, you know, for a long period of time, it's very deceptive to whether you're going to create that change. And then all of a sudden it's disruptive because mm. you have the majority of the people believing that they, that change is going to happen. And now everybody gets on board and they, like I said, not consensus, but they're like, well, I'm not going to go against the majority of people that are moving towards a bigger and better future for our country, for our world, for our company, or, you know, even for our community neighborhood. I mean, it can happen in HOAs or it can happen in the family unit is, you know, if the family's not going well, 
these conversations, this model really, really does work. Wow. So environment is key because then you can have an environment that's supportive. Yeah, I mean, environment is, you know, the, the thoughts and habits and stories you tell yourself are based on the environment that you're in. So, you know, it's your five closest people that you're hanging around with. It's, it's why I continue to spend more and more time with you to think bigger and bigger. I, I want to solve global problems. Um, I see my career, to, to your question, the 10-year vision on, on us or, or this future is that I see us solving some major, major problems because I think you have different pieces of this puzzle I think I've have the experience to kind of deliver a message that could really drive momentum and, and literally create the change over time, but also get people so they have a model to facilitate because it's going to take an army to facilitate the change at a country level or at a company level. And that's what I've been doing is really, you know, how do I go into a company and create as many change agents as possible so they see the future of the company and then they are there every day to know the best way to do it. I'm not, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, being a facilitator is working not to be an expert in the space that people are in, but mm. facilitating them to share their expertise. So not getting in the way, literally getting out of the way so that people kind of create the momentum they need. Ah, yes. What a great combination and a great place to develop such a skill. Hmm. Wow. What um, what are some places in the world that you like, man? If we could solve that problem there, that would be a huge success story. A you know a a case in which we can demonstrate with that hey, it worked here, it will work here. Where are some of those places that you think? I know we've talked about Israel, but are there any other places that you're thinking? Well, everywhere. I mean, everywhere has conflict and issues. I mean, there's not a subject that doesn't need momentum. However, you know, Einstein is a great quote that you you got to really respect is, however, whatever caused these problems, we have to think a different way to solve these problems because the future today is so much different than what's been in the past. So we can no longer use the same ways that we've solved for things. And I think as we've created a globally connected networked world, um, we have exponentially, you know, disruptive problems, meaning, you know, the fact that Twitter is really important to keep people alive in countries that are, hmm. you know, basically authoritarian and regimes that are, you know, without communication getting out. We know that that kind of communication has saved lives. So all of a sudden, you know, communication is a weapon um, either for or against um, any country or person in this world. Mm. And that's where, you know, part of some of the great companies I work for, they were known as great, great companies that never had any issues until social media allowed the masses to have a voice. Then it became clear um, oh. the issues that they had within those companies or their products or the things they were doing to society uh, the status quo is how do we disrupt that? How we challenge the status quo? Because, you know, we can't continue on this path to just let the world kind of happen. We have to get very much intentional. It's kind of like our own health. It's like, how do we get an intentional path to the future? Part of it is to get together and get enough perspective so that we can solve for those issues in a new way because we are no longer to solve for them as we've always solved for them. And that, that goes to family issues. I um, mean, it just even goes to parenting. Um, you know, I, I realize of a 16 year old daughter that, you know, social media has a great impact on her because of endless scrolling. So how she spends her time comparing herself, uh, cancel mm -hmm. culture, she's exposed to everything you can possibly be exposed to in, you know, in an hour. So how does the uh, rewire the brain? Yeah. And then how do you actually, you know, disrupt that so that she can think bigger about herself again instead of getting caught up in an endless scroll and a feed that doesn't always says that you're not enough because every marketer is just saying you're not enough without my product or joining my service or doing that or doing this. So all of a sudden, you know, once you could get past that and help people think bigger, part of that is uh, disconnecting from that and, and figuring out for yourself what's your 10-year vision because it likely isn't that you're going to have a vision that you're, you know, scrolling on your phone in 10 years. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. Yeah. Man, there's a lot to think about here. I think that the world right now really is uh, 
collective effort of why it is the way it is. A collective effort of ignoring certain things, not talking about certain things, not actually facilitating and knowing what really people want and need, but people with the biggest voices are saying this is the way or this is not the way. So even in the micro, in a, in a company, or, or even in one, one's relationship or in, in our homes, but even in the macro as we zoom way out, that's happening nationally, internationally. Well, I mean, it's as you say in, in, in some of your upgrade trainings, it's, it's you know, the secondary gains that these people have to kind of keep momentum. Yet, I mean, it's the kind of idea if you're in an international beverage company that serving a beverage is not good for people, that, you know, everyone in the room is not drinking that beverage. <laughs> they're not letting their kids drink that beverage, but they're selling that beverage to the masses. That inauthentic oh. story it's the same as uh, Tim Cook saying, I wouldn't let my kid, you know, use an iPhone. You know, you see these tech executives that their own products, they realize the effect that they have on people. So what you do for this, same with a doctor. Like a lot of times I, we work in the longevity space. I work with the healthcare system and you ask doctors like, okay, healthcare needs to be disrupted. Right now it's a very reactionary, let's wait till you're sick and then you know, then we'll get paid and yeah. doctors are paid for that. So I always have to ask them just this question, what would you do for your family? And it's always different than the path that they would take. So when you make things personal, you start to realize whether someone's a billionaire, um, whether someone, you know, is a CEO of a company, you know, when you have a personal conversation, it's very different because they're all scripted at a certain point, you know, and that's why every politician is only reading off of voter data to say what is going to get me the most votes from this issue. And unfortunately, that's not how they feel. And we haven't seen um, an authentic, you know, really leader in a while because they're so filtered and anchored in data oh, that then they cater to that. And unfortunately, part of facilitating is actually getting out of that data and getting into the emotion so that you can create action where people feel good about doing things that are different. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So simple, so profound. And the, the reason it's profound is because you're able to take all decades of experiences and, and really filter it down to simple things that people can apply. Yeah, it's not, I mean, I don't think it's complex. It's it's really just understanding um, that we're emotional beings. Humans are, you know, emotional. And, you know, the logics are going to keep, if money, where energy, you know, if you take energy exchange as money, you know, and you talk about this, uh, where where your energy goes, flow, you know, what, what flows goes to that energy, right? Yeah. Well, then logically, our path is set for doomsday and disruption meaning that there's no one safe on this planet if we're going to do what we've been doing. It hasn't been working out. We can take a look around, and we know on the international stage uh, with the potential of World War III, which would be good for nobody on this planet, with the potential of different countries and their own anchored belief systems yeah. are only going to get us into a place that's going to get us more and more trouble. What we have to do is break it down. What would you do for your family? What would you do for their family? And the reality is uh, the media knows that I've got to get you scared so that I can give you heightened attention and awareness so you're paying attention to this message so that you hate those people. But if we're all one, if we're all connected on this world and we all share a field of quantum energy or whatever you want to say, then when we hurt those people, we hurt ourselves. And there comes a point where... People know that in their gut, their instinct, yet they're logically thinking over that because of the command and control mentality of countries, of companies, of team leaders, yeah. of systems, of family, even family members, that you start really trusting your gut mm. because you're working on a higher level of consciousness to understand the unintended consequences of your actions versus having a point of view that your point of view is most important 
Um, in marketing, I we used to say this when I did my digital strategy is, although your opinion is important, uh, it does not matter. What matters is what your customer's opinion is. And that would always get, okay, we have to talk to enough customers or enough people that are paying money, exchanging energy for a service to really realize what do we need to do next to kind so of expand. True. Yes. So true. And everyone, every leader thinks they have it figured out, right? My goal is to help them realize that they have a piece of the puzzle, but they don't have the puzzle. Mm. You know, I had an interesting experience a few years ago. You probably heard the story, but for the listeners, this might be worthwhile because it, it connects to the dot of what you just said. What would you do for your family? I was at a clinic. Um, a doctor said the test that came back about my daughter when she was in the womb was abnormal, she said, or, or they said. So we went and saw this doctor, and everything he said was terrible, was worst case scenario. And in fact, he spent probably a good 10 minutes saying, here's how you end this pregnancy. And here we are, not even sure if the data was even good, right? And then before I left, I asked him, doctor, what would you do if it was yours? And he was like, I will not answer that. And that actually told me everything about what I needed to do. But that being said, he paused for a good 30 seconds. And before I actually left the room, he's like, well, you know, one of my chi children had the same test result. Turned out just fine. And I was like, you spent the last hour pitching me something that didn't even feel ethical. All of a sudden, I asked that question. He gives me the real answer. And he was very cryptic about it because he didn't want to sway me to not follow some of the things that they were suggesting. But man, how often do humans really think of ourselves as families, right? I think that if people really begin to realize that it's like watching a little kid fighting with their sibling. They think it's the end of their world but really they're siblings. That's really what's going on right now in this world, except they, instead of having a couple of sticks and a spatula or, or a toy car, they have nuclear weapons. Well, we've dehumanized it, right? That's, that's we've removed those elements. I mean, you know, if you think about any atrocity, it's, you know, the person that creates that atrocity and the other person that receives that atrocity, you know, both are chipping away at their soul. You know, there's no win. So then you have to take a step back to say, how do we think bigger about this issue than what we are right now? And, you know, and that's where there's a lot of miscommunication and confusion in the world of what different sides say and do and everything. But we need to kind of get to a place where we start thinking about, you know, to your point is that we are all one big family and the reality if uh, a nuclear weapon goes off anywhere, it affects all of us. And it's, it's not going to be a good thing. Um, it's not a good thing to fight in the name of a religion and also of a country. You know, and I think it's United States has misstepped a lot, you know, wanting to go out there and create democracy when they are sharing that with countries that their religions intertwined with their government. So then they think it's an attack on religion. And I think those are kind of permeable, you know, how do you actually change that message? How do you actually change that it's for all people, you know, that, um, you know, whether you see people as, as yourself or as, as us and them, that starts that language of we've seen in national politics, even in the United States has really divided us and, and created all kinds of issues because it's really, you know, to, to stuff, you know, you teach it upgrade, it's, it's really creating ancestral trauma, you know, that's coming out. It's really driving out, okay, my ancestors had a triggerable reaction to these messages. And all of a sudden, you know, hatred and things that people didn't even know they had are, are kind of getting 
brought up because of the language and use, intentional manipulation of the masses. And I think that's part of, you know, a, a, an awakening or, you know, a consciousness is like, how do you raise the consciousness and know that when someone is, you know, looking to manipulate you to, you know, change your point of view, which um, as long as you hear all the different sides, it's okay. Um, but when someone says they're for one candidate and that candidate, I believe in whatever they say, that's where you have real problems. I mean, that's where Hitler, that's where, you know, got a bunch of leaders to say that, okay, I believe in this opinion of this is the way to go. But even in our country, you know, you have to look at the different ob objections and say this person has a lot of good qualities and has a lot of bad qualities. And I think you can say that about every politician in the world right now. But then judge them on that versus maybe the party they belong to or anything because in the end, the, the parties and what they originally stood for have all changed and evolved because of manipulation over the last, uh, you know, 50, 50, 100 years. So we have to kind of take it at face value to say the future of our success is going to be in people that have character and people that are conscious and think about the whole, not the parts. And I think the language right now has all been about the parts, meaning I want to divide and conquer versus I want to bring together and grow. And exponential thinking um, and some of the leaders that have created the most change in the world is because they've worked to bring people together. Then people have learned in those systems how to divide people. And that was never the intent of some of these founders that I've shared, I've been in the room with. But if you really look at it, it's like humans are humans. They're going to look to get advantage on anything they can get until they become aware that actually hurts them every time they do that. Oh, man, that's so true. It's like uh, if a food company put bad chemical in, in the food, maybe their kids don't eat it. The executive's kids don't eat it. But their kids' kids will marry those who did for generations. And they're going to end up being the ones sitting in the hospital bed watching their grandkids suffer. While they can trace back 50 years ago, they made the decision to put certain things in the food. Well, and that's just another evidence of how you got to think longer term. Because if right now, if we, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll pick on a specific issue. If we go pay off everybody's student loans that took loans out and decidedly said, I'm going to take a loan to go do this and sign their name on the dotted line and then all you're doing is you're borrowing from today, but then their grandkids and my grandkids and your grandkids are going to have an exponentially bigger bill to basically pay for that today. So we have to really stop thinking about how do we actually solve for now? Because some of these exponential issues, we have to get through this idea of a deceptive curve to solve these problems. Mm. And that doesn't, you know, as much as, you know, things all happen now. It's the fact that you have a vision on something much, much greater that'll help as you gain that momentum. And that's where I see change in major companies that I've worked with or exponential, even small companies. You know, once you get aligned and you start executing on that vision and everybody understands what that vision is, um, the, every conversation in that organization or in that country or in that family unit is different about the objective of fulfilling a greater vision than what they have right now. And I think that's part of facilitating, it's part of confidence to know that I can go into any room, anywhere, anytime, anywhere on this planet and have a conversation that moves people to think bigger about themselves personally, because all of a sudden I'm, you know, part of my goal is to say, well, personally, to your, your story about the doctor, what would you do and what would be the best? And if you had all the resources in the world, what would you do? And you have a very different conversation with a doctor you know, when you make it personal and about their kid, and about like if you had unlimited resources and I have a kid that has a, a rare genetic disorder and, you know, exhaustively have spent traveling the world and meeting with doctors to kind of solve for that. And I always found that when I asked these, I facilitated these conversations, I was able to open bigger and bigger doors where, you know, even the head of TGen, uh, Dr. Franks, um, I was able to kind of, who created the genome, you know, understood this rare genetic disorder, got me with the experts in the world around this. We were then put with, you know, different doctors that were able to kind of help uh, my son Maverick 
kind of overcome a lot of obstacles where, um, you know, he's a healthy 10 year old now. And the reality of his rare genetic disorder is that he was unlikely to live and wow. has fought uh, against that his whole life. And to his own knowledge and reprogramming to upgrade is um, doesn't believe there's anything wrong with him. And he only knows love. I mean, and, and he really does. He's uh, and believes that, you know, in a future and, and often our conversations are about longer term future so that he has better short term habits, which is a lot for a 10 year old, but um, it's enabled him to kind of overcome the obstacles that he has. But it's the same as me facilitating a CEO or, a, you know, someone that has um, all the control in the world because of the microphone they have um, with that, you know, takes responsibility. And that's where um, helping all everyone have a longer term vision will help create a better world. Mm. So here's my takeaway. Tell me if I'm being accurate here. To have real confidence. One needs to have long-term vision and they need to have the personal interests of wanting to know, really know what other people want and need. Not just at a surface level, but deeply. Because when someone does know what the other people want, not just what they want, but what other people want, they are able, the other people opening up personally, they are now able to see a pattern. And so over time, this pattern establishes and the confidence is easy to have because you see a pattern and you can operate based on these patterns are very predictable, especially when you care about people and what they really want and what they need with love, they open up and they're not having conflict with you. They're interested in making it work. So they're on your side now, especially if you put it on a long-term timetable. Now everyone's on the same page. How could you not win? Well, and, and I think the, the only thing to add to the idea of exponential theory is, is we think bigger, you become more conscious. That's what exponential, that's what exponential theory means. Mm. And in that conversation that I would have with these individuals is um, every problem, unintended consequences within the problem set you have can be solved if you think big enough. And the reality is what most people focus on are problems ah. that are so short term that they'll disappear anyways if you just focused on a bigger problem. So that's why I think uh, the law of attraction or whatever brought us together uh, in a very unique serendipitous way, but it's part of having a conversation is, okay, if you wanna upgrade humanity, I wanna create a million change agents. How do you marry those so that we can do that faster? Because facilitating that change and giving the tools that you have, you know, making that tool belt available you know, makes people think longer term, have a bigger vision. And all of a sudden you start incorporating within a good facilitation, you start incorporating where these small problems that really take up most of everybody in the mass, you know, are worried about these things. They just go away because when you have a vision to upgrade humanity, you're not thinking about the same things. So the everyday problems that, you know, and I know this from getting to know you, you don't have the everyday problems that people have. You're not worried about those things. You, mm -hmm. no matter who you are, and this is the other thing to know about billionaires and everything, the bigger you think, the bigger the problem is, the more complicated it is, the more insight you need from the more people to get, to recognize that pattern, to get people to think more longer term. And this may be Elon Musk's greatest attribute is like, how do I synthesize? And I think synthesizing is probably the skill for this next hundred years. How do I synthesize the patterns that I'm seeing? The emotional patterns. Because the data often fools us because the data is paid for by special interest, by a marketing department, by someone who has a specific outcome they want to create. The real way to solve a problem is to listen to enough customers, if you're a company, or enough constituents if you're in politics to really understand what is the fabric of this issue so that I can emotionally take into consideration and create a big enough solution that it encompasses the majority of people to not create consensus, but that everyone wants to create action. And unfortunately, you have a national election coming up here in the United States that has two different parties 
that for the first time in history, you have people literally battling for the least like politicians ever, but winning their primary, they're going to win their primaries and kind of go, go to battle against each other, only battling to the bottom, to the least common denominator, not to necessarily unify or solve any bigger issue. It literally is to separate and divide people, you know, based on specific issues that people care about. And unfortunately, we have to set aside some of those specific issues to think longer term. When we start thinking longer term and we have bigger thinking, we can solve for all those issues. Now, there's, you know, some of those issues are very polarizing. Uh, the reality is we have to kind of figure out how do we compromise and how do we grow and learn so that we can get beyond these issues that we think are the end of the world because a lot of them are short-term issues that we're literally creating bigger problems by making them the most important thing. Um, but if we thought of everybody on this planet as, you know, family, as you said, you know, you start to think different how you would solve problems. It's the question that you could ask anyone. I have a solution. <laughs> yeah. You need to run for president. <laughs> How, how awesome would that be to have an expert facilitator in the office who actually is interested in bringing the, the, the country together and have the skills to sustain it? I mean, not a joke. I, I think that's something worthy of your consideration. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to respond on the podcast. <laughs> but, um, you've got the face for it. You've got the presence for it. You've got the skills for it. I think that it's uh, something to consider. Yeah, I think politics are an interesting place where, uh, unfortunately, for the near term, we have to create more of this mindset to to kind of unify versus divide. And it's part of why I was a, an advisor to No Labels. So, you know, the group that was really running the third party, um, you know, I've met Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I've spent some I've spent a lot of time in politics um, and understanding that right now um, someone like myself wouldn't wouldn't really be a good choice. Uh, we have to grow and evolve and facilitate a few conversations before that could happen. Um, and more. part of it, if it's not me, it'll be one of the million change agents that go through this training that you and I are kind of putting together to upgrade humanity. Because I think what we really need is uh, a momentum and some a movement to kind of realize is that we are in control of our future. And every one of us has a voice. I don't I don't move away from, you know, it's not the first time someone said that to me and it's, it's definitely not going to be the last. And part of me facilitating is solving very difficult issues that are hard to talk about. And that's what a president should be able to do. But right now, all they're doing is dividing on every one of those issues. They're making a stance and then literally polarizing the people on the other side of that issue based on the fact that they know they could get results, whether you're a Republican and you get the rural vote or you're a Democrat and you get the urban vote, you now have different sets of issues that cause different complicated, you know, outcomes. You know, can we simplify that? Yeah. Where does America need to be in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? Where do we solve for this? It's, you know, in healthcare, I work with a few boards in healthcare and it's like, hey, we're not going to solve healthcare in 10 years, but in 50 years, what is it going to be that it's not now? And that's something really easy for everyone to get their head around. What does America need to be in 50 years until we get a longer term vision? And, you know, you can say, you know, one of the last great presidents that was liked by both sides was John F. Kennedy Jr. He put a 10 year plan to go to the moon and was able to galvanize a nation into into a movement uh, to really create alignment on that vision. And we executed against it and everybody was for it. It was the most exciting moment you know, one of the most exciting moments of, of uh, that generation. And I think that then leads to where do we find our next pivotal moment that's not a reactionary moment. Like World Trade Centers was like, okay, we're unified because it's us against them. That still is, in a way, not going to, it's not going to upgrade humanity. We need to find a vision is how do we help all people? You know, and that's where there's a lot of empathy around Gaza and we can go to Israel and really get very specific because you and I have spend a lot of time talking to leaders um, around that issue. But you have to understand all the different perspectives to really have a, an opinion on that. Right now, you just have opinions with different perspectives. 
And I think that's only going to polarize. And that's what news has done is polarize this issue to where, you know, does anyone really know? It's kind of like Occupy Wall Street. Does anyone really know what that was about? Um, you know, we, we have to think bigger than what we are thinking now. And it's not about dividing people. It's about, like, how do we create a solution that's bigger than the problem? Now, that, as we've talked about, is, you know, a 2,500-year-old problem of a land that, candidly, nobody really was interested in until everyone was interested in it. And I think now we have, you know, what we'd say is religions which anchor our deepest beliefs into a place that we're willing to, you know, do against what any religion would ever teach you <laughs> in the name of your religion. So the contradiction, the inauthenticity of that is literally to step back and like, okay, let's just redefine the words we're using. And this is where I would, you know, facilitate this is how do we actually use words that help people think bigger about their region? Because the region now impacts the whole world. And we start to see that. It's not about us and them. It's about all of us. And every single human being that's lost on either side is not a good thing. It's very true. It's very true. So the final point is the bigger we think, the more effortless, the easier it is to have confidence because we're now thinking with greater amount of data, but not just the data that we talked about, but the emotional data too, because we begin to take in things to support the creation of the solution for this bigger problem. So that causes confidence, wouldn't you say? I think that's... Well, the greatest confidence is when you go with your gut or you go with your heart. And those are emotional sayings that, you know, literally the gut is a, a bigger mind, takes into more consideration, maybe part of the subconscious that we don't know. Uh, the heart is the emotional, you know, mind. And, you know, different uh, religions have use that in different ways. But when you really get beyond the thinking mind, which is the executive decision, the, you know, the prefrontal cortex of making decisions, and you get beyond the amygdala, which, you know, then traps you from being, in, you know, really thinking about it, gets you into fight, fight, or fear. When you're thinking about it, you're overthinking about it. And thoughts over and over are rarely positive. <laughs> we never think about you know, the benefits are all the good things that are going to happen. We think about all the negative things are going to happen because we're trained by the amygdala to do that so we can survive. Part of it is, is getting beyond that into an emotional state to feel. What does it feel like to have a bigger solution? What does it feel like to think bigger? And as you paint the picture in some of your exercises is getting people to use all their senses to paint. What is the future that I have? that I want to embed as a memory so that I live into that future. If you do that with enough leaders and enough people, you now can transform anything. And I think that's where my vision and your vision and the alignment we have is we're on a path of execution. And I see our different worlds, you know, really complementing each other. And I also see we bring very different skills to the table to be able to solve much, much bigger problems than anyone could ever perceive being that we're here in Scottsdale, Arizona. But when you have enough people thinking big and even your community of upgrade of big thinkers, all of a sudden you start to create momentum. You start adding change agents in that, people that actually want to facilitate this. We can create the momentum to change any issue on this planet, um, including Israel, including Palestine, including you know, Hamas and Gaza and you know, that whole area of the world, including Russia and Ukraine. Like, there is no issue too big to be solved. It's just you have to have enough people thinking about it and enough perspectives to really get it. Because right now, we're listening to a few perspectives that are dominating the conversation. It's just like me walking into a boardroom. I have to dismantle those. We have a few world leaders that are giving their advice, and everyone's just following. And uh, unfortunately, that hasn't led us down to the best path ever, right? We're, we're mm -hmm. not in a good place that... Uh, you know, historically, there's been much worse times, but, you know, I would say the hope for the future is less because we have so much negative data. So we have to get past emotional to understand, like, how do we get to a place where we feel the future? And I think, uh, I think you and I can do that in a, in a very big way. And I'm excited to have that partnership and figure out how to think bigger together. Same, same. And I think that those of you who are listening and watching, it's time to consider everything we 
just talked about and specifically think bigger and imagine the best, most ideal future and feel how that feels like, right? Come and pick up some skills from us and learn how you can help other people, including yourself, change and get into that state so that we can get, like Aaron said, more people in that state of thinking about and feeling the solution and think bigger. This is good to have you on here. Thank you. Thank you for being I mean, we spent a good 70 something minutes chatting about this and I couldn't be happier because I think that people can sense that when we do come together, there were, there are, and, and it's not just you and I, there are a lot of people out there with great skills that have just not been the voice. They haven't been very loud. They've been just hiding themselves away. It's time for them to get up. It's time for them to wake up. It's time for them to contribute and join this cause of upgrading humanity. Thank you again for being here. Thanks, Will, for having me. I'm excited to be part of the community and uh, excited to solve, you know, global problems. Let's do it. And beyond. Yes. And beyond. Thank you. Mm -hmm.